There's been a lot of talk lately about us watching a movie as if all the events around us have been scripted, but little talk about what that movie is. There are various references that could be made, but one of the biggest ones I feel isn't being talked about. And that is the movie Camelot, except that there's a struggle to control this narrative, or perhaps an injection of opposite approaches to it. So you have people trying to re-establish Camelot as the news narrative, and others trying to invert it, turn it, up, turn it upside down, or parody it. So the net result is something like a cross between the 1967 musical movie Camelot and the 1975 parody Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Camelot itself is supposed to be one brief shining moment and nobody talks about what that one brief shining moment is as if the whole plot of Camelot which takes place over several years is the moment compared to the relative span of history but within the movie itself there is an actual place that you can pinpoint exactly what Camelot is. From the beginning there's this tension between Arthur's desire to establish the rule of law and a societal contract where the strong, the military industrial complex, the knights, work to defend the weak and meet as equals around a table to discuss and implement laws that will work for what's best for everyone. The opposing force to this, of course, is infidelity. So the people trying to implement the rules have impulses to break the law, and if they're the king and queen, when they have affairs, that can be considered treason. So there's this tension between the two, and even before the round table convenes for the first time, the seeds of the destruction of Camelot have already been sown. But Arthur carries on, knowing that there's already trouble because of Lancelot's attraction to Guinevere and vice versa. But he manages to get the round table convened and immediately after that you get the one scene where his efforts are shown playing out in the public arena. That is when he visits a village and a villager comes up to him holding a bucket full of some sort of metal objects and he says, Your Majesty, I've come here as an emissary from the village of Glenfield. We have 23 shots, shops and not one door with a bolt, not a chain on a stable, a bar on a gate, a latch with a lock, and our children walk free on the roads because we live in the England of King Arthur. Here are the keys of Glenfield, Your Majesty. We need them no more. This vision, of course, is completely inverted right now. People are increasingly not being freed from needing their keys by the state, but instead being locked down by the state. And one of the most severe lockdowns of recent times is in Wales, the actual site of Camelot in the 1967 movie. So once they have this opposition in which we're being promoted we're with one version of the, the dream of the, of the Kennedy era to establish this sort of state and bring elements of, the, of power that are unaccountable to the electorate into the public sphere so they'll make a positive contribution that has been undermined at the same time and you get this bizarre parody, this cruel joke which would be funny if we could look at it from the outside which would be like a comedy if we weren't involved in it. Several of these scenes resulting from this can be read as parallels to the Holy Grail movie. One of the earliest is of course the in, re, in the the dream of Camelot, of course, is to build a castle, and a, a very a beautiful sort of of state symbolized by it. But the man in the Holy Grail, Monty Python movie, repeatedly tries to build a castle, a better state symbolically, in a swamp, Washington D.C. in, in the 
corruption it symbolizes. And of course, he has to try multiple times because he tries to build his castle and it sinks into the swamp. There's a parallel also in the, the historical times that gave birth to the Arthurian legends around 542 AD were also the time when the bubonic plague first hit Britain. So there's a plague narrative, but a particular bizarre form of plague in the movie because a man, in response to the call to bring out your dead, tries to bring out a live man and pass him off as a corpse. <laughs> so there's this reallocation where people trying to scam and work the system to make a little extra coin by redistributing people from the dead column to the live column or vice versa. There's also after that a trial of a witch conducted by Sir Bedifier, a character defined by his dedication and his designation by Arthur, who are you that is so wise in the ways of science? And of course there's been plenty of pseudoscience the last while in relation to various subjects, but he presides over the trial of a witch. I guess that one of these was discontinued a while ago because there was not a sufficient threshold of proof in saying that because someone weighs the same as a duck, that's not, strictly speaking, an impeachable offense. There's also an uh, echo, it seems to me, for anyone who's, who followed the Epstein drama that's still ongoing. One of the scenes where Galahad visits the Castle of Maidens is like uh, recalling a spin, a positive representation of what it would be like to be discovered on the flight list of the people who visited Epstein Island and to try to make tell the story from your point of view so that it won't look so bad. There's the Black Knight episode, which reminded me very much of the, the recent attempt to stop counting the vote, even though it would, in some cases, delay the tallying of votes that would be in favor of the candidate trying to stop the count. So the Black Knight, in symbolically trying to stop the vote count, stands at the bridge and says, none shall pass. <laughs> you can imagine at this point his arms labeled Arizona, Wisconsin, and his legs labeled Michigan and Pennsylvania. And of course, if you've watched the movie and, and know how the, the fight unfolds, his determination to take this defensive stand and not abandon it at any cost results in the loss of all of his limbs. Uh, the departure of his opponent, even as the stumpy black knight yells after him, come back here, you pansy, I'll bite you to death. Now, this role, of course, is not, probably won't be played out in only one way before the whole saga is done. It'll probably be done from the reverse point of view, so whatever your political attitude is, you can probably play it out either way. The real treasure, I think, of Monty Python references to the corruption and our attempts to deal with it is the constitutional peasant scene. Dennis the constitutional peasant in his dispute with King Arthur who makes one remark that perhaps would have been pertinent to people trying to call various states and turn them blue ahead of time. Ironically, some of these states being the, the driest states in the Union, saying that supreme executive power is derived from a mandate from the masses and not some farcical aquatic ceremony. So there's a host of these, these references that seem to come up. And if you don't know the movie's script, and I think and you don't know what movie you're taking part in and being made to watch, then we can't question the value of the movie and whether it's something we should be aspiring to emulate as a society. There's levels of, of trying to get at someone telling the story or telling the truth that have to be sorted through. And in some ways, some of the people who like Lancelot in the movie musical are 
assaulted and by with people making accusations that are technically true must pay attention to in that he's exiling all the knights who challenge him saying he's having an inappropriate relationship with the queen but since he's stronger in combat he can beat them and they're given the choice of exile or death and they're kicked out at point at which point Pelinor <laughs> someone who's a, a very daughtery and absent-minded and misplaces his kingdom and in some ways symbolizes a, a famous person in the current political debate says if this continues soon there are going to be more knights out there than there are in here though so these debates continue on the the challenges continue on but in our current land landscape there are some insights to be gained from these people saying things that are true and being kicked off the platform one is that some of the largest channels sometimes start to act like gatekeepers so there's various levels of gatekeeping you go from the the legacy or mainstream media who have distributions of millions upon millions of people down to large social media channels you maybe have hundreds of thousands of people and you get a little more of the truth going to them but those people can be viewing it from only one side of the political debate so when you want to see the core message of what the campaign is about you can go from the legacy media level and you might get a little hint of some sort of disclosure on a subject like UFOs or what Camelot is and you go down another level and you'll see large channels that are viewing things from more of a conservative point, uh, viewpoint so they hide the fact that part of the message actually came from a democratically elected president of the Democratic Party namely Kennedy so they the large channels from the right side were hiding the part the fact that the core of the movement was talking about trying to emulate Kennedy who was a Democrat so now the only channels who haven't been taken down at some point are the ones talking about the hints and hidden messages and codes mentioning similarity to Kennedy but that in itself hides another message in that some of the things Kennedy tried to do were neither right nor left they're just about trying to bring certain parties accountable uh, change the monetary system which hadn't been done since Lincoln in trying to bring out a system of currency that was government issued instead of privately issued with high rates of interest and bringing the CIA under control or disbanding it and charging or removing some of the tax perks of oil companies but the Kennedy message itself was still in some ways a collectivist message ask not what your country can do for you but what you can do for your country and though he, though he brought things like secret societies and the need for freedom of speech and the takeover of the media by a vast conspiracy to public attention there was one aspect that still wasn't dealt with was the way that we approach dealing with aging because cloning and similar issues had not yet come into widespread public discussion at the time so you go through all these levels of dealing with the questions we have to look at to have a better society and simply taking us back to the ideals of the Kennedy era I think does not quite address all of them if we can get to the point where like the peasants in the time of Camelot it's one brief shining moment we can now do away with our, our locks on our doors and various other commercial and industrial establishments and our f children are walking free on the roads there will still be more to pursue in equality between the state and the individual in that the state doesn't age and the individual does and that will still have to be addressed and I would hope that the discussion of this Camelot narrative is not distracting people from that taking them 
back into the past to a time when we weren't discussing the issues as much and distracting us from the importance of bringing equality to between the individual and the state in terms of aging.